Rebecca Giggs, congratulations. Thanks, Ben. It's wonderful to be with you today. <laughs> so Fathoms is your debut book, and since its release in April earlier this year, it's gotten so much praise and acclaim from Australia and beyond. Um, the New York Times called it delving, haunted and poetic. The New Yorker called it masterly. And today you've won the Mark and Yvette Moran Nib Literary Award and $20,000. And I'm curious, you know, what does winning this prize mean to you? I mean, I'm thrilled. That's the, the first thing to say. And out of such a competitive field, you know, like the shortlistees this year were phenomenal books, many of them such intriguing Australian topics and such a wide range of research undertakings and subjects. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, having had time to process it now, <laughs> this little bit of news, um, uh, I feel really um, grateful. I, this represents for me more than anything else, time. Um, in a year when a lot of writers have really been questioning what are the material conditions under which we make our work and what are the aesthetic impulses that are coming out of the pandemic. Um, oh, you know, the chance to have that lump of money to buy me some weeks of writing time to really process that um, and potentially to, you know, get started with the inklings of a new project um, free from the pressures of commerce is just such a blessing. I'm, I'm so grateful. It's, um, yeah, and it also feels a little bit like a bit of a homecoming for me. Um, I'm on the other side of the world at the moment. I've been here um, for the year. I've been trying to get back since August. <laughs> um, and uh, I remember writing a part of this book actually um, uh, in Sydney, you know, right on the edge of the Bondi Cliffs when I was feeling quite stressed about it, going out there and seeing the humpbacks leaping. Um, and so to have something coming from Waverley Council, it, it just, um, uh, I feel connected again to my community. Um, so I'm, I'm so grateful. Well, the community misses you, Beck, And I'm sure that um, as much as you're grateful for the time, your readers are very grateful that you have the time. So we have more of your writing to read. Now, your book, Fathoms, uh, blends natural history and philosophy, science, history uh, in general to really dive into the history of the whale. And we really see that whales have really occupied human imagination for so long, whether it's in early cave paintings in this continent or in Inuit mythology, um, in Chinese kind of myth, Icelandic, African legends, the Old Testament, of course. Uh, how long have whales been occupying your imagination? You know, I think a lot of Australians feel a strong connection to Wales, particularly on the East Coast. So I grew up in Perth. I lived there till I was 30. Um, so we never saw humpbacks come in that close. They tend to stay on the other side of Rottnest Island. Um, but, and yet, you know, whale is the letter W in every child's first alphabet book, right? It's, it's the, it looms large in our culture. And in the book, I talk about how the sort of instigating incident for this project was that I attended a whale beaching off the coast of Perth a couple of years ago now, where a, a large um, humpback whale had stranded on a sandbar. And myself and some other people, including wildlife officers, helped get it back out into the ocean. And then it returned and it re-stranded and it died. Mm. And there was a really strange mood of kind of macabre carnival that attended that whale beaching because of course everybody rushed down to the beach to see it up close this amazing arrival from the deep sea um and they bought their children and they bought their dogs it was um a real community event and yet here was this large animal suffering on the sand and so the way i've been telling it anytime i talk with media is that this is really the instigating moment for the book but if I'm completely honest, I actually sat there with my notebook thinking that I would write a short story, thinking that I would write fiction. And it took me some years to kind of really grapple with the um, non-fiction elements of that story and to realise that there was a bigger narrative about global change that could be told through whales, not just about animal welfare, but about climate change and about 
change in the oceans, ecological change, sonic change, chemical change, and in industry. Um, and so the whale really became this sort of Trojan horse, in a way, to bring people a narrative about planetary environmental change, especially those people who are not that environmentally minded. Because I feel like many more people care for whales than would consider themselves a kind of greeny environmentalist. Mm. You know, the Lib Nib Literary Award has such a strong focus on nonfiction books with huge research element and reading fathoms, you can see how much research would have been required. Um, there are so many surprising moments to, to readers about the history of the whale, but looking at the past and especially the economy of the whale, um, mm. what were the big surprises for you? What did you discover? I think I had it in the background. You know, I, th I, I knew from high school even perhaps that whales had been an integral part of industry and you know my mother's from the southwest so she grew up down in near albany a small town near albany and albany was west was australia's last whaling station so she has lived memory of being down there um you know the, the whaling station closed in 1977. So she remembers really large sperm whales being kind of drawn up onto the forecourt and processed um she has some wonderful stories about, you know, the, the old salt fishermen in the bay kind of beating back sharks with their oars. And my grandfather was a very passionate fisherman um, at any length. So I, I kind of knew that whales had been an industrial product, but I, I hadn't realised until I dipped into the research just how plentiful and exhaustive the products were that came out of the whaling industry. Our forebears lived in close proximity to products that were either made using whale oil or from the bristly substance that some whales have in their mouths called baleen. So some whales, the way they feed is they, they sort of have a mustache inside their upper lip and they, they draw in water with fish and copepods and little crustaceans and they push it out and it stays caught in their mouths. At any length, that baleen was like the thermoplastic of the time. Um, it was molded into a sundry range of products that went from women's fashion, so the corsetry, the boning in women's corsetry, to um, hula hoops, to the very fine spring mechanisms in watches. Um, it was used in surgical stitching. We have this expression to wail on in Australia, which comes from literally the canes that we used to you know, beat naughty children in school were made from this baleen substance. So it was everywhere. Um, and that really amazed me. Um, and well, I think so, also- So that, that's the past, right? And how like our forebears are really interacting with whale and whale, whale products. What about the present? Because I was surprised to learn just how recently commercial whaling in Australia had ceased, but they still do play an important role in modern life right now. How so? Yeah, so, you know, we do tend to think of whaling as this thing that should have gone the way of like Victorian seances and smelling salts and, you know, it feels really 19th century. And there were economic conditions that should have really displaced whaling as an energy source. So whale oil was being used as an illuminant and also as a, a lubricant in machinery to fuel the late stages of the industrial revolution. But once you have petroleum products, once you have, you know, um, uh, what's the turpentine, you have um, other forms of illuminants that you can, you can use. Um, yeah, we should have seen an, an, a tailing off of whaling. But paradoxically, the fossil fuel era actually accelerated whaling because we had faster ships. We had ships that ran with refrigerators so they could store whale meat and whale blubber for far longer and render that blubber on the deck of the boat. Um, and that meant that whalers went deep into the Southern Ocean and started pursuing whales that they hadn't pursued before. Mm -hmm. Different species, bigger whales, faster whales um, that they, the new boats could keep up with. And there was a kind of, you know, in the history it's referred to as the Whaling Olympics in the 60s, um, where whalers competed to get as many of these animals as they could in anticipation of strict regulations coming in in the 70s and 80s. Um, so it's really a story about the way in which the invisible hand of the market doesn't come in and just like 
shift us from one energy source to another. There needs to be cultural change around it too. And I think that has some resonance for us in this moment as we're thinking about, you know, moving between the intractabilities of fossil fuels and all the embedded political, um, you know, inertia there into renewable energy. The really cultural change has to accompany that too. Mm, I mean, uh, tell me more about that because, you, you know, you highlight the remarkable ways that whales can help us understand Earth's environmental emergency that we're facing right now. Um, so given what's been going on, I mean, climate change has been happening for a long time, but it feels to be climaxing right now with what's going on in the world. Has that made you think about the whale differently and what can the whale tell us about this current moment and the future? Yeah, so, I mean, I understood whales the, as a global animal before mm. I began this project. And I think even though Australians have a strong national connection to whales, we're conscious that, you know, Americans have Moby Dick and, you know, the British also have a strong connection to sperm whales. Um, so it seems like, you know, they live in the global commons in the deep sea. They're kind of shared internationally as a, as a resource. Um, and yeah, so I, I understood them as a global animal, but it wasn't until I'd read this news story um, from a few years ago in 2013, there was this one gigantic sperm whale from Spain washed up off south of the coast of Granada. And it was dead when it, it washed up. But in the process of examining it, biologists did a necropsy. So humans have an autopsy and animals have a necropsy. Um, and they looked into its stomach and they found this stupendous medley of objects. They found um, ropes, they found hose pipes, they found bits of bedding and coat hangers. But most alarmingly, an entire greenhouse. So this collapsed structure made of tarpaulins and burlap and other bits and pieces, all kind of bundled up had ended up inside the whale. And I think, you know, I'd been writing short fiction at that point and I read this and I just thought if that was, if I was to put that in a novel, the whale eating the greenhouse, it would seem like an incredibly clumsy metaphor for this collision between 1980s greeny activism and the global climate crisis, like literally eating the greenhouse, the greenhouse effect. effect in an animal. Yeah, it's the metaphor we understand our crisis through. Um, and yet here was this piece of news and it kind of hadn't been processed in that way. So that really gave me the moment of being like, ah, this is a, this is a science literate story. It's a story with a curiosity for, um, you know, history and philosophy, as you say, but ultimately it's about, it's about narrative. It's about the ways in which when a whale arrives on the beach and it's full of bits and pieces of people, it means something to us because we have these mm. stories in our culture. Um, and so, yeah, that was the point at which I realized that a whale could be used to tell a global story about trans-hemispheric plastic pollution. And then later when I started looking at things like the blubber, which often carries heavy um, doses of pollutants in it, um, that there could be a way to kind of break the whale down and think about its impact, the way it kind of reflects global change. Yeah. So this story in so many ways is a big global macro story. You know, it's a story about the environment. It's a story about history. It's a story of economics. I'm wondering, you know, you are in this story as well. And there's the micro too. And I'm curious as to whether this writing process and writing this book has changed you. It makes me think of those moments where you find yourself aboard a whaling boat. And in another situation, you're potentially sacrificing your vegetarianism with a family of a whaler. Like there are such interesting conundrums. What's this book done to you personally? A few things. I think, yeah, that, that moment in the book is a real moment of change. Um, I go to Japan to meet with um, whalers in Japan, but particularly to understand what Australia's connection to the whale looks like from an international perspective. Um, uh, you know, I, I, the sort of reporting that I did in that period was not to really kind of unpack what the Japanese are doing with whales as much as to understand the contrast between those two nations. Mm. Um, and I was surprised actually how, how incredibly attached and how storied the whale is in Japan. It's not the case that it gets kind of relegated to the status of a 
salmon or an oyster or another form of seafood, it is a storied animal and it's eaten. So there is this kind of shared attachment um, to the animal. It's just that its charisma in the West has resulted in a kind of green devotion and mm. um, activism, whereas in, the, in Japan, it's been different. At any length, yeah, I, I was uh, on this forecourt and I was offered a bowl of soup. Um, and uh, I had been vegetarian for seven years, I think, at that point. Um, and not so much out of activism, more kind of for my health than any other reason. Um, but I wanted to curry favour with these guys that I was hoping to get to interview. And so I, I took a mouthful of it in the moment and, um, and tasted the whale, which is very hard to describe if you haven't eaten meat for seven years. What does it taste like in comparison? Um, and uh, yeah, it, it was really the thinking, you know, from this macro level to the, you know, the whale in the world to really the whale inside me, like in my mm. mouth. Um, it was a revelatory moment. But you asked also how this has sort of changed me longer term. And I think the one thing that I would say is that I now look at plastic, particularly when I'm in the supermarket, I always thought about the pollution that might be generated in making something. I never really thought about the pollution that things could become downstream after they leave my kitchen or my, you know, where I live, where does that stuff go? Um, so I think much more about, you know, objects being kind of haunted by their permanence and they're like continuing mm. in the world. Yeah. Uh, that all is grim in so many ways, but I'd like to finish on an optimistic note. There is a line from your book where you write, life pops and it's through the whale, um, the piñata's cracked open, flinging bright treasures. Uh, tell me about those treasures. Yeah. Um, so this uh, sequence in the very front of the book, a uh, piece of writing about what happens to whales when they um die in the open ocean and they fall down to the seabed um and this bewitching menagerie of deep sea creatures collect around the whale to decompose it there are strange kinds of octopus and worm and clams and some species that exist only on whale bodies and nowhere else in the ocean so they just float around as larvae, like stardust in the sea until they find a carcass that they can consume. Um, and I really, I found that just such a metaphor, I suppose, for, you know, we can see the end of a whale as a tragedy on the coast, but when you see it in its ecological setting, you understand that it, it's a turning point. It's actually like springtime comes to the deep sea when this carcass arrives. And there's this huge energetic input and, um, you know, all these other creatures are kind of um, brought up um, into this great flourishing. And yeah, I think that a lot of this book is also about where we find turning points, what kinds of energy in a moment of decline can be used to instigate new beginnings. Um, and yeah, so that kind of, the poetry of that instance really um, drove the book all the way through, you know, it, it was the, um, yeah, it, it was the kind of energy that I needed to get all the way through, it was thinking about that decomposing um, uh, and somewhat magical whale in the deep sea. Yeah. Well, before we let you go, Rebecca, um, I would love to know, you know, what is going to be your next step after this? I know that's a little bit like asking a new parent, you just had a baby, what's your next baby going to do? What, you know, it's, it, it, it's a little bit coarse, but any, anything you're allowed to tell us right now, any hunches? Oh, no, it's not that I'm not allowed to say anything. It's just that all my ideas, you know, I think you probably know this as a writer, there's a phase in an early project where it's like, it's like Bambi, you know, it gets up on its like stuttering legs and, and you, it's still kind of wet and, and you don't even know if it's going to survive the first, <laughs> the first season. So I, I do have ideas, you know, I've got a wall of post-it notes at the moment that I'm, I'm beginning work on. Um, but it's a little too early to talk about another big project. I am doing some short work. Um, uh, I write occasionally for the Atlantic, so um, I'm going to continue to do, do that in the coming the coming year. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm sort of 
I'm focused on getting back to Australia and and getting some stories, you know, like kind of reconnecting and and doing some reporting in Australia as well. Um, so those are my two big things at the moment is sort of early ideas and um, yeah, and, and getting home for, for Christmas, I hope. Yeah, well, we can't wait to have you back in the country, Rebecca, but um, congratulations on winning this year's Mark and Yvette More and Nib Literary Award. Um, it's a huge achievement, congratulations. Thank you so much. And I, I wish we were all celebrating together in the library, but um, it's, I'm very grateful for the chance to have this conversation and um, yeah, to the prize organizers who've made such strides getting the technological side of this to function. I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful. So thank you to you too, Ben. Thanks, Rebecca. Look, if the Emmys can do a socially distance award ceremony, yes. we can do one too. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you.